Hey everyone, my name is Eric, and today we're going to be talking about the Car 15. These glasses are terrible. Go ahead and roll the intro. Hey guys, thanks for checking out another Hatchet Cast episode, and today we're going to be talking about the Car 15, otherwise known as the Bud Diamond AR, otherwise known as the XM177, or the GAL 5. Um, pretty exciting episode. I've been waiting for this for a long time, and this has been an unhealthy obsession of mine. But before we get started, make sure you hit the like and the subscribe button. As you know, hit the notification bell. It really does help out the channel. If you really want to be a big supporter, obviously you guys know to come and train with us and also check out some of our other channels that we have, but we'll talk about that at the end. Today we're going to talk about the history of this type of weapon system and also kind of the inspiration for why I built it the way that I did and also what kind of went into it. Uh, then we'll talk about my experiences with this system specifically. We'll roll into the most important part, which is the parts list. You know, where do I get all this stuff? And then we'll wrap it all up as far as a summary and how I think that this can actually be an applicable weapon system. So without further ado, let's go ahead and talk about just a little bit of history behind this system. Now, this is known as the XM-177, otherwise known as the CAR-15, otherwise known as the Colt Commando, or the Blood Diamond AR, or the Black, Hat, Black Hawk Down pre-Gordy Carbine. Um, honestly, there's so many different names, and this is not clone correct. So disclaimer, this is not clone correct. Um, but this was a super fun build. Now the original XM-177 came out in 1966 and it was actually to answer the needs of MACV SOG and Special Operations Forces fighting in Vietnam. Actually the advisors uh, were the first ones to start receiving this and then obviously it was used by the renowned MACV SOG unit that we know about today. Um, as far as the, the links that it was available in, there was a 10.5 and an 11.5 length barrel. Uh, it did use a carbine length gas system and also the Air Force made its own version called the GAL-5 or the GAU-5. Um, what's really cool about this system is a lot of the thought process that went behind it. And this is kind of where we start to see a little bit of, um, in, or actually a lot of bit of innovation when it came to weapon systems. If you look at the uh, you know, World War I and World War II, the primary fighting rifle were long, full-length rifles. World War II, they started getting a little bit shorter, and they were also running into submachine guns. And then, uh, you know, in Vietnam, they were utilizing 5.56, which was a huge change because a lot of forces around the world were using big boy cartridges, you know, like uh, 308 or, uh, you know, different size, different millimeter size, you know, 7 millimeter or uh, 7.62 by 5.4. So, a lot of big boy rounds, and then in Vietnam, we started going to a faster round, which was the 5.56 round. Now, the original infantryman was given an M16, uh, and they had different variants of that, but the Special Operations Forces needed something smaller and in a tighter package, as well as a lot of the air crew. So they wanted to be able to have the same cartridge to be able to shoot and use because it was very effective, but they needed a smaller package. And if you think about like in the jungles of Vietnam, the MACV saw guys or the Green Berets or the SEALs, they were running into really, really dense, thick brush and having a very long wieldy M16 was just kind of problematic. So they wanted to be more maneuverable. So going with a shorter system was the way to go. Now, what's interesting is that the, uh, you know, they started going with the shorter system and they started figuring out that when I shorten up that barrel and I shorten up that gas tube, so I'm not going from a, I'm now going from a rifle length gas tube and gas system to a carbine length, 
um, there was going to be reliability issues because there just wasn't enough back pressure to be able to cycle that bolt, right? So um, one of the things that they actually did is they designed a moderator. So the moderator originally in its design was used to increase the amount of back pressure so that way the gun would run more reliably. And then also, it would also dampen some of that sound. So the original moderator that was on this type of weapon system actually had baffles. It was almost like a baby suppressor with an A2 style flash hider on the end of it. So one of the side effects from that, you know, with the original tent being sound dampening, not sound suppression, but sound dampening and also increasing back pressure, was it had a deeper throatier sound. So it kind of sounded almost like a, a, an M16, like a longer system. The longer your barrel, the deeper, throatier sound that is, the shorter your barrel, usually it's gonna be a snappier, uh, more crack type of sound that comes out of that system. So um, this actually helped this gun to sound more like an M16 or almost even like an AK. Now it depends on how you look at it, but I think it was more uh, an, of an M16 that it started to sound like. So what's interesting about that is in MACV SOG, whenever they're running their Car 15s or, or Green Berets around the Car 15s, it kind of gave off the same sound as an M16. So the Viet Cong or the NBA had the impression that, hey, maybe there's just standard infantry that we're going up against. Um, but obviously the sound dampening and the back pressure was the primary role and purpose of this muzzle device. The other things were just, you know, just happened to be that way. So that's just kind of some interesting uh, stuff about that. Now on the back of it, behind this moderator, there is a grenade ring, uh, which by the way, this is not a moderator. We'll talk about in the parts list, but this is not a moderator. Moderators are NFA items, which is ridiculous, um, but it's not a moderator. This is a linear compensator, uh, different design. And so anyways, there's a grenade ring on the back of this. So you can attach a grenade launcher if you wanted to, um, but it is a very iconic look when it comes to the XM177. Now in the movie Blood Diamond, they actually had a very different, it almost looks like a longer, it looks like a moderator without the birdcage on the end of it, which is kind of a cool look, but uh, it did help a little bit with sound suppression. It was almost like a barrel extension for that, uh, for that weapon system. But if you start looking at what this design started to do is it started to help the military innovate into what we have now, which are more modern AR-15s. So, you're talking about going on a shorter system. It all originated from the XM177. Now, what's really cool about this thing is it actually had a service life from 1966 to 1998. In fact, the Air Force actually used the GAL-5 even longer than that. I remember when I was going through my training program in the schoolhouse and um, we actually got GAL-5s. And I thought that was like really cool. Now we were using them in training, but still, it was still officially used by the Air Force in either a training role or a schoolhouse role for a longer period of time than 1998. Uh, and so for me, that was in 2009? Yeah, 2009 is when I actually, you know, used the GAL-5 uh, in, in the schoolhouse. So really, really cool, has a lot of history behind it. I'm not the guru on this. You can actually check out a lot of other YouTube channels that have a lot more in-depth history on this gun. But for me, I just had an obsession with the way that it looked and the way that it shot and also the history and the lore behind it that I actually just had to build one. So let's talk about next, what were my experiences with this build specifically? All right, so when it came to me doing a build that was inspired by the XM177 and also the movie Blood Diamond, um, I actually tried doing this project years ago. Um, and the problem was, is I actually had used, I had an old Colt upper receiver laying around and I was like, oh man, okay, it, was, it wasn't laying around. I actually had a friend of mine who had one, he was an older, older gentleman and he had a bunch of old spare parts. And I was like, I wonder if he has a carry handle upper receiver. And I was like, hey man, you got a carry handle upper? And he was like, yeah, I'm probably some of my throwaway bin. And I was like, I have, can I get it? And he was like, yeah, sure. So he, he gave it to me. Um, which is really cool. And so I was like, dude, I, I, I can finally start this blood diamond build journey. Cause at that time, a couple years ago, upper handle or upper receivers that have a fixed carry handle, not a Picatinny one, that's a removable carry handle, but a, a standard upper receiver that has a fixed carry handle is, it was really, really hard to find because manufacturers just kind of stopped making them. So 
a lot of guys were just finding older parts and kind of smashing them together. And um, so I had actually taken an old Palmetto State barrel that I had found and, an, and uh, it had already had the front sight post pinned on there. And I remember when I put it together and I was super excited, I got the, uh, the moderator replica uh, from TNTE Sales. So there's other websites that have all that stuff, but it's either sold out or it's a scam website or it, they take your money and they don't deliver for 14 weeks, that kind of thing. So TNT Sales was actually able to get back to me pretty quickly when it came to getting me my, uh, my, moderator, my moderator replica. So I put this thing together and I really wanted it to work, man. Like I was just super excited about it and I'm running it with the guys that we shoot with all the time and we were doing run and gun and dude, the recoil on that thing was ridiculous. It was thumping me almost as bad as an AK, like a standard stock AK or a 308. It was just creating so much more additional recoil. And then eventually what I found out is that the, the gas block, that front sight post gas block that's right here, was actually pinned onto that barrel crooked. So there were two roll pins that go underneath that had they had drilled out grooves in the bottom of the barrel, put that front sight post gas block on, and they had pinned it and it was slightly crooked. And also it was so over gassed that the gun was literally beating itself apart. And uh, I'm talking about ejection was coming out at like one o'clock, just pretty much going straight forward, which was insane. Um, super gassy, just, it was not fun to shoot. And uh, it really kind of bummed me out, you know what I'm saying? So I kind of ripped the gun apart and just set it aside. I was very disgruntled. And then recently I was just, I don't know why I got another wild hair at my butt. And I was like, hey man, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try and build it again. So um, ended up ordering another Palmetto State upper, ripping that upper apart and putting the barrel onto this upper receiver that was just laying around again and put it back together. And now it cycles so good. Now, a lot of that has to do with, in my opinion, the linear compensator that came from Griffin Armit. So Griffin Armit just released this linear compensator um, and they are out of stock very quickly. So if you're gonna get one, head over to that site as fast as possible, probably right now, pause the video and go get one right now, and then come back and finish the video. Um, they're super hard to get, they're always out of stock, okay. uh, just because they're so legit. And so what helped a lot with the gassing and the softness was this linear compensator, which is a moderator replica. It's not a, it's not a moderator, it is a linear compensator. And what it did is it, one, it directs all that energy and that recoil and that concussion forward uh, away from the shooter. And because I just happened to get lucky, I got a Palmetto State barrel that happened to be pretty well gassed. Um, now, in the past, I was literally looking at front sight post gas blocks that were separate from the barrel and putting that on myself. But the problem is, is that when you mess up those pins, it's extremely hard to get a front sight post gas block onto a barrel, get it nice, get it pinned where it's not gonna roll on you. Uh, it's actually really difficult. So um, that is something that I had to figure out was getting a barrel that already had the front sight post gas block pinned onto the barrel and hopefully, fingers crossed, that it was not going to be jacked up or the port be extremely wide open. So now this gun actually recoils so soft and it gasses so well that all of my ejection is at four and five o'clock, which if you know about you know good ejection and good, well gas regulated guns, that is perfect. It is like creme de la creme, it's exactly what you want. Uh, and I ran all different types of ammo types through it. You know, I ran some A1 through it. I ran some uh, M855 green tip. I ran Franz through it. I ran um, 55 grain Magtech. I ran 55 grain PMC, XTAC. So I ran some 223 through there. And, it, and even with the softest ammo, like that 55 grain AAC cheapo ammo, it was still running and not having reliability issues. So that was really, really cool. Um, one of the things that I also loved about this gun is the fact that I can actuate my light control so easily. It's so easy to hit that light and it's just really nice. Maybe a little too easy. Uh, so whenever I am doing stuff at night, I almost unscrew the cap all the way so I don't ND it, or I'm just really self-conscious of that. Um, and I also love the fact that I have my aim point is set really high. Similar, it's actually the exact same height almost as a Trigicon RMR 
uh, that is on top of an ACOG. So if you ever see an ACOG with an RMR on top, that's about the same height as what this aim point is when it comes to the height of the carry handle and where your optic is. So your height over bore is very similar to an RMR on top of an optic, uh, which has already been natural for me because of shooting GPRs and all that type of stuff. I'm already used to that. What's really cool about this is also the ability to aim passively under night vision. Because the optic is elevated so high, it's, it's almost intuitive, man. It's really neat. Um, and also I can still use the iron sights in the carry handle and I actually zeroed those. So instead of backup irons, I mean, I guess it's built-in backup irons. So um, that was really neat to be able to use that and uh, was able to, you know, stretch it out and uh, hit, some, hit, hit some targets at 100, which is nothing crazy, but with iron sights, you know, it's pretty decent. So the grouping wasn't that bad. Um, one of the other things that I did is I, I just love the feel of this thing and I forget, you know, shooting modern rifles and modern builds all the time. Like I legit forgot how lightweight this thing is. Like it almost feels like a toy. Um, with your more modern stuff, as soon as you start slapping lights and lasers and rails and rigidity and more optics and magnifiers, that thing starts weighing a ton, um, you know, which is good, but sometimes it's nice to be able to have just a lightweight system and it really gives an appreciation for the classics, you know? Um, you know, during that time, there was so much innovation happening from the 60s to the early 2000s, you know, things were changing so fast and rev revolutionizing that it, if that stuff had not happened, I don't think we would be where we're at today when it comes to gun technology and parts and accessories. So it's really kind of, really kind of fun to, uh, to play with. I was definitely reminiscing about roaming the plains of Africa and uh, helping rescue people from uh, the blood diamond trade for sure. But uh, it was uh, really, really cool. Love, love the build and it was a pleasure to shoot. And uh, I honestly, the one problem I had with it is that I just wanna keep shooting this and I wanna put everything else away and just keep shooting this. Like it's, it's just a lot of fun, it's lightweight. And I actually had some applications that I really thought were pretty reasonable for still using this as a legitimate weapon system to use for preparedness. So um, I'll actually save that towards the end. But let's get to the most important part and the one thing that you guys are probably looking for and be like, Eric, hurry up and be quiet and get to this next part, which is the parts list. And so I'll do a full in-depth parts list talk up on this gun now. All right, so starting from the very front, if you didn't do so already when I told you to, go do this now and go straight to Griffin Armament and get the linear compensator. It's the XM177 linear compensator moderator replica. Um, what's really, really cool about this is there's actually, I've, I've used the older replicas that are from other sites that are other manufacturers. And with my older build, what I saw was is that they had a small, 5.56 five, size hole, obviously, at the base, and it was a long tube with, uh, you know, flash hider grooves uh, cut into the end. So it wasn't really doing too much to help with recoil or back pressure or anything like that. It was honestly just a hole with a tube, and it was mostly for, yeah, somewhat flash, but a lot of it was just for looks. Now, they did have a grenade ring, and so a lot of those replicas, if you don't really care too much about the compensation, you can get those from like TNTE sales or Brownells, and you can get them for really cheap. They're like 65, 70 bucks. So if you don't really care too much about the compensation, then you can go pick up a, a replica if you're just trying to go for the look and the feel. Now, if you're trying to actually make this device do something to help with recoil, then I would recommend the Griffin Armor, Griffin Armament Linear Compensator. So there's actually a chamber inside of here, very similar to a crink. If you look at that, there's no baffles inside of it. It's just a chamber that's a linear compensator to be able to direct that energy forward. So it's very similar to like your blast shields and things of that nature. Really, really neat. Um, the other thing I would recommend it would be like is the, uh, probably the crink, honestly. I wouldn't even say it's like the flaming pig, but it's very similar to the crink. Now there is something that I did notice is that sometimes you do get a fireball every few shots. So that is something to contend with. I don't, you know, at night that's obviously gonna be a concern, but during the daytime it was fine. Um, you know, just something that you have to deal with. But 
You can, they do have flats on here, so that way you can actually get this thing on, and they sell the grenade ring separate. So if you don't want it, the grenade ring, you don't have to get it. However, for me, I, always, I thought it was like the overall look that I really enjoyed. Uh, and I also have to say a disclaimer that Griffin Armit did send me this. So I did not purchase this with my own money. They did send it to me, but I was super excited to hear about it and actually will be purchasing other ones from them for other builds in the future. Um, now, working back, I do have a flashlight clamp that is straight from Amazon. And if you look at the Blood Diamond picture where Leonardo DiCaprio is freaking blasting away to save the father and his son, and you zoom in on where he is shooting, you know, and he has his flashlight clamp, this is the same flashlight clamp, this one. And this flashlight clamp is from Amazon and you can literally buy it for $8. Now, I will say that we will have all the links on where to get all the parts, like we'll have a full parts list in the description below. So make sure you guys check out the description and check out the parts list and that way you can click on those or copy and paste those links and find it directly through our description in this video. But this thing did require some TLC, right? So I had to do some Dremel work on there. And what I wanted to do is I wanted to make this upper plate fit underneath the gas tube and in between the gas tube and the barrel and have it clamped that way so it was nice and secure. I had to use a metric ton of Loctite to be able to make sure this thing did not move. So this thing is probably gonna have to get cut off, most likely. And then I have an old school Surefire light that is a very, very simple handheld light. And then a 100, 100 Concepts light cap, and it's just a medium light cap. So super cool, a little bit of a modern touch and consideration for a retro build, but um, that's what I have for my flashlight. So you're gonna have to do some work on it, but you're able to be able to get that thing through. Um, now, inside the A-frame front sight post, I do have a QD clamp for a QD point for my sling. So I actually got this from a friend. I don't know where to get it, but I believe if you look up A2 front sight post QD sling attachment, you can actually find them. And uh, this actually clamps into the inside of the front sight post and allows me to attach a sling to my front sight post versus having to use a sling swivel. Now the sling swivel that is on the bottom of this A2 front sight post, I actually had to uh, punch that out and you can actually get a punch and a hammer and punch that thing right out. Or if you wanna be a mongrel, you can cut it off. Um, but yeah. Now, when it came to the hand guards, this is a double heat shield skinny hand guard. You gotta make sure you get the skinny one. There's two different sizes. Now, when I go on to Palmetto State Armory, for example, and you buy one of their upper receivers that's like a standard run of the mill upper receiver and it has these plastic hand guards, it's gonna be the fat old school M4 or actually like more modernized M4 fat hand guard. And that's not what you want. So you can actually go on Brownells and buy their retro skinny hand guards. And I think it's like only like $10. So you don't have to break the bank. It literally is just a plastic hand guard. The only thing you gotta make sure is that it has the heat shield on the inside. Because as you start shooting faster and more rate of fire, or higher rate of fire, that barrel's gonna heat up, and when it heats up, those heat shields, if they're not there, your hand's gonna get hot real quick. So make sure it's a real one that has a heat shield. Um, now, the upper receiver, I actually bought, like I bought a complete upper receiver from Palmetto State Armory. Um, and now I know my last CAR-15, I had issues with it, but this one, I was like, guys, maybe I should just do it, just bite the bullet, no pun intended but I bought a standard upper receiver. It was actually on sale. So it was, I think, 350 bucks normally, and I bought it for like 170. So I actually took that upper receiver. It came with an A2 front, uh, A2 front sight post. It had a, a flash hider on it. It was a 10.5, and so I ripped it apart, took the, you know, the, the ring sleeve or the handguard sleeve or handguard ring off. I took the, uh, Hand guards, tossed those, and I actually took that upper receiver and set it into my, my bin, my parts bin, so that way it can be used for a future build. So I do get a, a, a spare upper receiver out of it. But the biggest thing I wanted was the barrel with the A2 front sight post. Now when I bought that, it didn't have a, it already had a gas tube with it, but it did not have a charging handle or a bolt carrier group, which is fine because I already had my own bolt carrier group and charging handle that I was gonna use for this build specifically. 
So moving back, the upper receiver is actually a Colt Legacy uh, M16A2 upper receiver and um, not their typical A1 upper receiver. Uh, and that you can actually buy those, those upper receivers, the A1, the A2, and the A3. You can get them from TNT eSales and they actually make their own. If you want to, you can buy it without the Ford Assist. You can get the one that has a Ford Assist. They make all different versions, but you can pay TNTE to get one of theirs that they make, and they do make a fixed carry handle upper receiver, and they're usually always in stock, so that was pretty cool. If you're not wanting to go through the process of building this out, you can actually go to Palmetto State Armory and type in retro rifle build or retro XM177, and you can buy a Harrington and Richardson upper receiver that's completely built out already. It's already ready to go. Now it's gonna run you like 650 bucks. So you are actually able to, in my opinion, you're able to build this out cheaper than building it complete. The other thing is, is that when you buy it from them, they have a pencil barrel inside of theirs as it traditionally should. But for mine, I wanted to have a thicker barrel so it's a government profile. Now going to the uh, upper receiver, the mag or the, uh, the optic mount is actually a Leopold screw on optic mount. And I actually got this from Amazon. So you can get it for like $39. What's cool about the Leopold mount is one, it's made by Leopold. So it's good quality. It has a screw that goes inside of a hole in the carry handle. And there's actually a hole that goes through the length of this Picatinny section that allows me to still use my iron sight. So that was really, really neat. And then as far as the aim point, had that around for a while, but you can pick them up on uh, either Optics Planet or you can go get them from Amazon. Um, you know, you can get it from Primary Arms or Palmetto State Armory. You can get those. And it's the Aimpoint Pro Patrol, Aimpoint Pro Patrol or the Aimpoint Comp M2 uh, Aimpoint. So what's really cool about this is they last forever. It does use those weird batteries. So you got to order some of those online, but it lasts a long time. Now for the the aim point ring, this is very important. You need to get a 30 millimeter lower, I can't remember if it's one third or one fourth, but you need to get a lower um, scope ring and it, it, it can come by itself. So I actually got this one on Amazon and I actually have the link for that in the description. This is a vortex ring that's a 30 millimeter and that allows the aim point when it comes traditionally, you have a higher mount, like a, a co-witness mount. And so this brings that aim point down really, really low and almost touches the rail. It just leaves a little bit of space above and that's how you want it to look. If it sits too high, it just looks awkward and it's just the height overboard is gonna be insane even more. Um, now this upper receiver is a Colt Legacy upper receiver, like I said, and it did have uh, the front sight or the rear sight already attached. If you get a TNTE sales, upper receiver that's stripped, it will not come with the Ford Assist and the and the sight. So you gotta have that installed. So I recommend that you buy a complete, just the upper receiver portion where it's already built out with the dust cover and the sight and, and that, so you don't have to deal with that. Now going to the lower, it's the standard run of the mill, mill spec lower, and the grip is an A, A1 Griffin Armament grip, which they don't actually make those anymore, sadly. Um, but what's really cool about that is you can go to a mill surplus store and buy an A1 grip. If you don't really care about the grip, I've even seen, I've actually done this in the past, is I've taken a standard A2 grip that you get with any lower parts kit that you buy, and there's that finger groove in the center, and I just take a Dremel and I grind it off. So if you're trying to go for the aesthetic and the feel and be replica correct, clone correct, go buy an A1. Otherwise, save your money, buy an A2 standard grip. You probably have one laying around from a past build and just grind off the nub. Now for the trigger, I'm actually running a LaRue MBT2S trigger and dude, you can buy it from LaRue for literally 115 bucks. And as far as trigger wise, it is probably one of my most favorite triggers of all time. It is a two stage trigger. Um, and it breaks at four and a half pounds, has a really clean reset. It, it's just really nice. It's, they, people call it the poor man's Geisley. Uh, it's got a huge uh, face and surface of the actual trigger shoe, which is really, really nice. I like that. I also have a Magpul bad lever on this as standard, and I do have a Norgon ambidextrous mag release. You can actually get cheaper ones like Strike Industries or Troy or um, Another good one is CMT makes a ambidextrous mag release or maybe it's CMMG. But either way, there's tons of mag releases out there on the market that you can get. So as a lefty, it's, it's huge. 
Now for my charging handle, I am using the Griffin Armament charging handle, and this is actually the Snatch Gen 2. What's really cool about this is it's an ambidextrous charging handle, so I can rack it from either side. And also, Griffin Armament, as we know, makes really, really high-end suppressors, so they know a lot about how to make equipment to help with gassing and regulating gas away from the shooter. So there's actually a circular U-shaped, or it's a U-shaped vent on the inside of this uh, charging handle that actually helps some of that gas that usually comes out of the top of the charging handle on a mil-spec charging handle, and it redirects it forward away from the user. The Gen 1 had it where it would come directly out to the side. This one, they actually have it where it turns away from you and shoots the gas away from your face, which as a southpaw is very nice. For the bolt carrier group, I am using a Griffin Armament bolt carrier group because I had one land around and it works really, really well. And as far as the buttstock, this is a B5 Car 15 buttstock. Now, if you really wanna go super fancy, you can get the aluminum butt stock, but it's gonna run you like $116. And I wasn't going for clone correct, I just wanted to have my own version of a Blood Diamond build. So I got a B5 uh, Car 15 butt stock, and you can actually get them on Palmetto State Armory, you can get them on Primary Arms, you can get them on directly from B5, you can get them on Optics Planet, there's a ton of places you can get them, and they're running about 50 bucks. So just a really cool system. They also have a QD, uh, mount that you can actually put into the rifle sling slot of the CAR-15 buttstock so you can run a QD attachment on it. And I also have a 3D printed CAR-15 cheek riser that I had printed uh, for this build that was a, a personal uh, cheek riser that I have out. So um, as far as the buffer system, I'm running a standard buffer tube. It's a six position buffer tube, but I do have a blue Sprinko spring buffer spring and an H2 buffer. So it's a heavier buffer system to kind of slow that bolt down a little bit more to make the soft, the recoil a little bit softer. So um, that is what I'm running for my buffer system. Overall, like I said, guys, we're gonna have the parts list inside the description of this video. So if you're looking for parts and you wanna be able to build this out exactly how I have it, go check out the description and we can find all the parts and copy and paste all the web, web freaking codes or whatever they're called. Um, but let me talk about what is a good application for this weapon system. Is it still applicable? And why would I even build one in the first place? How can I, is this thing still applicable today? And um, we are very much about being very purposeful for what you buy and what you own and training with your equipment. Um, but sometimes there is, <laughs> some validity and just scratching that itch and just having some fun. Um, so this was honestly originally something that I did for fun, for my enjoyment, for my entertainment, um, and also just my appreciation for the classics. But as I was using this more and more, I was like, man, as far as like a patrol style rifle, even though it's not free floated, uh, like all of our modern ARs are, this is so light. It's almost to the point where if I was going to be like the DMR guy for the squad or the marksman or carry a Mark 12, maybe a Mark 12, maybe like a AR-10 or a bolt gun, and I had to carry a backup rifle, I almost would be very tempted to just run this because it's so light. Um, and it's also really good for passive aiming. So even though I can't have a laser put on this, I can make up for it by still aiming passively through the optic. And also I have my light. So this is something that I think is actually, as far as in the jungles of Florida, I think has a lot of applicability. And if we look at the conflicts around the world, like what's going on in the Middle East, and even some of the South American countries and some of the other countries around the world that are um, in conflicts currently, they are still using this thing. They are still using this rifle in this exact type of system, and it is still very, very effective. So at the end of the day, as far as applicability, Sometimes it's good to have things for fun, but if this is what you got, this is what you're gonna use as your main squeeze, the biggest thing is training with it, like really getting proficient and good with it, understanding like how not to flex the barrel because it's not free floated and, and what that means and also when not to activate your light and how to be get really good at getting a good chin weld with your natural point of aim. All of these things start flooding your mind because 
you are training with that system and you're doing what's right by getting as many reps as possible. So that kind of leads me into what we talk about all the time in every video is make sure you go out and train. You are worth the investment. It is so important for you to invest in yourself and to give yourself the training. So I can keep, you know, take a really, really Gucci'd out AR and if someone, I give it to someone who doesn't ever train, they are gonna get outpaced, outshot, and outrun by a dude who trains all the time with the very, very simple, classic, basic system, right? So it's not the weapon system itself that makes you a good shooter, it is you. You are the tool, or you are the asset. This is just a tool that complements the shooter, right? So biggest thing is go out and train. Guys, if you got something out of this video, share it with a friend. Go check out some of our other videos we have on the channel. Also go check out the Hatchet Cast podcast. Uh, on our other YouTube channel, as well as on Spotify. It's the same thing. We do have a podcast that we record episodes every week. Um, also, go check out our Instagram for any behind-the-scenes type stuff when it comes to Barrel and Hatchet, what's going on stock in the store, and come train with us. We love training with you. We do have some two-day, we have a two-day scope carbon class coming up to Element. So if you live near Mississippi, the upper panhandle of Florida, Louisiana, Texas, Georgia, Alabama, you are actually within driving distance of that class and that will be in June. So go check out the website and see when there's gonna be a class in your general area. Uh, we love training with you. The biggest thing guys I wanna leave you with is remember that we are put on this earth for a reason and that every single one of us is loved and has a purpose. And that purpose is to find hope and salvation in Jesus Christ. And I wanted to kind of leave you guys with this reading. And it's in Matthew chapter 5, and I'm going to start with verse 2. Now, Jesus is actually sitting on the top of a mount, and he has his disciples with him, and he's taught, te preaching a sermon to, to this huge crowd. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Guys, if you're not a believer and you are curious about what is this truth thing? Uh, what is this? You know, we live in a world where truth is so hard to find. Literally, your eyes even deceive you. They put out so much different information everywhere. And the Bible is the truth. It is the Word of God, and it gives you hope. It gives you hope whenever you're beaten down. I've been there. I've been depressed. I've been beaten down. I've been in full of anxiety. I've had a broken life. And coming to the arms of Jesus and just accepting and receiving His love and receiving salvation has completely transformed my life to now where we're just trying to be obedient to Him on the Barrel and Hatchet channel and spread the message of love and forgiveness and salvation that Jesus offers as much as we possibly can. So if you're a believer or if you're not a believer and you're curious about it, let us know. Send us a comment, send us a message or a DM, and we will send you a gift. Um, if you are a believer, the time for closet Christians are over. All right, we have to stand out and be bold. We live in a time where everything's in turmoil and we need to stand up and open our mouths and witness to our loved ones and our family and our friends. The last thing that you want is to stand before the Lord in heaven and be like, yeah, I, I never told you know Uncle Jim about Jesus. I, I could have, but I just didn't because I was scared of what he would think or I didn't tell my friend about Jesus because I was scared of losing friendship or offending him. Guys, it is one of the most loving things you can possibly do is to witness and to give the gift Mess or the message of salvation and love to someone that you care about. So remember guys, always train, seek salvation, always seek the Lord. There is hope in Him. Train to be the eternal asset. And I will see you guys on the next one.